J'ai eu le temps de, de réfléchir sur la condition humaine. Bonsoir. 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 <laughs> it's a special edition tonight because uh, we are in Dubai and mm. it's uh, the first time we're doing it uh, abroad. We started in Beirut uh, in March last year during the lockdown and now we're here with a special guest and you're gonna introduce him. I'm gonna him. introduce uh, mm. my dear friend uh, Anas Bukhash. Thanks for coming and welcome to Serdi. Shukran. And us, um, I think what's you know, the reason why we have you here is obviously we're in Dubai, so we're like let's talk to an Emirate and you're a dear friend of mine. And um, right now we're in 2021. It's weird yeah. to say that. It's yes. weird to say that, and it's as if we we you know, we kind of went through the trauma of 2020. Mm. But so, Anta, how was your 2020 year, and how, where do you see it going? My 2020. Um, it was, I keep uh, labeling it with the word strange. It was a strange year, really strange. Uh, it had its good things. I think a lot of good things when you actually sit down and think about it. A lot of bad things also, obvious ones, I guess. Many obvious and many I think we will not know till many years. Like I was thinking, how uh, did the lockdown affect kids and anxiety? I don't know. Nobody can answer that. We will know in the next few years so. if kids become uh, too careful with touching things or shaking hands or I don't know. Uh, what did it do to couples? Some maybe it made them stronger. Some maybe can't stand each other. Yeah. Uh, nobody was used to being forcefully staying at home, no matter how much of an introvert you are. For somebody to tell you you're not allowed to go out, now you want to go out. Yeah, exactly. So, but personally, I remember Yani Muin, uh, thinking I'm a very elder brother. Uh, and you have two, two other brothers, right? Uh, from my mom and dad, uh, two, and then one adopted, and then four boys, Abdullah, three boys and a girl from okay. my father, and uh, Hassan from my mother. Okay, so football, eight yeah. boys, one girl. <laughs> <laughs> football. Yeah, total. Yeah. So, yeah, it's United Colors of Benetton. We literally look at us blonde, dark. <laughs> Um, so I remember how I felt and I have this uh, mindset of being the eldest brother. That's my wiring. And I'm like, I have all of these companies and everybody's thinking, oh, you have to fire people or you have to reduce uh, their salaries. And I'm thinking, no way, no way, not on my watch. I can't allow that. So stick to the reserves. I got in this um, mode where Anas, you have to take care of yourself. You have to be sharp. You can't get down. You can't get depressed. So I started working out every day, which I don't like to. Mm. I don't like working out that much. I'll do two, three times a week. I saw the videos, man. You're a beast. Every, every day, Moin. And not because I enjoyed, because I needed to feel good and sharp. And when I work out, I know it makes me feel good. So. It's a fact for me. For every day, every day, work. Be sharp, be sharp. Don't be down. Don't be depressed. And think creatively how you can get all of your businesses to... Flourish or sustain. And to, hey, so until you have, you're an entrepreneur. Or she, I think we have to come and introduce what you yes. do. Yes. Mm -hmm. Lebanon might not be aware, but until you have a, or she, you're the host of AB Talks, which is a podcast on the YouTube show. You mm -hmm. talk to famous people from all walks of life, but you kind of dig a bit deeper into what makes them human. Lano. Celebrities are usually kind of two dimensional figures, and people just see them as sometimes like a commodity, and they throw an opinion on them without really knowing who they are. So end up this early and you ask a very detailed questions and you get to know really who the person is. One of them actually was my dad. Yeah. Ali Jabe. It was a pleasure, that, yeah. That's what we're gonna do with you tonight. Okay, sure. We're Everybody wants questions. me to sit on the other side. You, you ask people to introduce themselves with one word. I tell Sometimes. people to describe themselves in one and word. How, how are, okay, I mean, how are you really doing? That's how I start. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. we did the mugs now because everybody likes it. So I'm like, if we can push the, this really, this question that everybody asks every single day, but nobody really cares. We all, we've all been there. Like, hey, how are you? Okay, okay. okay. Uh -huh. We don't really uh, listen. So if we can actually encourage people to stand, and I heard a lot of people will ask it, but never even take the moment to listen. So I say, hello, Muin, Akbar. And you're like, I'm not even listening anymore. I just did it as a you formality. Yeah. 
So did you ever stop when you walked by the, your secretary or whatever to say, how are you? How was the weekend? And like, oh, good, good. No, stop, stand, stand in your place. Hmm. Oh, really? How, oh, what did you do? What did you choose? Uh, not like I mean, I think in Lebanon, right? I think we're, we're always going to go back to the August 4th blast. I mean, we used to ask them, how are you? How are you? It was very, like you said, kind of uh, robotic. But after the August 4th blast, you would actually look at someone in the eye because you know some of them may or may not have gone to trauma and you, you ask them, how are you really doing? And surprisingly, a lot of, whether it's a friend or not, they tell you what's on their mind because, mm. you know, sometimes yeah. it's easier to talk to a stranger. We, we saw a lot of posts uh, saying it's okay not to be okay. Mm. And now we can say it. Aslan, we usually say it. Muayin always answer, we, uh, we survived. Hey, no, Jawab Ras Mesha Fi Wahdi. You know, like, yeah, I'm in one piece. Okay, then. Try yeah. not to go more into detail. No. <laughs> so, how would you describe yourself in one word? I usually avoid answering that question. I keep it a mystery. Mm. But I'll give you a few words. Because recently I did an interview and I gave them a few words. So, I'll be fair, Yanni. Um, curious. I'm a very curious person. I'm very disciplined. Uh, very focused, uh, very hungry, not literally, but hungry for life, really, anything. You want to travel, food, uh, experience. Uh, I want to explore life and learn and educate myself and read more and travel more and mo- meet more people. And I think these are words that uh, can describe. That's why you do multiple things. Maybe, yeah. Uh, I, I can't sit down. I don't know how to not do anything. So you started being an, an entrepreneur. I love it in English <laughs> because in French we say entrepreneur yeah. with the R. And uh, now you are like uh, Moin uh, said, uh, a host on mm. YouTube, uh, your channel and a podcaster. So can you tell us more about it? I didn't start being an entrepreneur. I did 12 years of corporate. Okay. Okay. So different things. What'd you do? One, I studied something that I really don't like, which a lot of Arabs would relate. Uh, I studied mechanical engineering. Started with chemical, was shit. And then I'm like, okay, I need anything easier. So then um, I had the scholarship in Boston and I'm like, can I change to anything else? They're like, your only choice is mechanical. I'm like, okay, it seems easier. Literally, this is my thought process. It seems easier. And I took mechanical and I graduated. And then first corporate job, uh, oil and gas second uh, property development because everybody was in that field at the time in Dubai and then uh, philanthropy so we were building uh, primary schools in rural areas in developing countries with UNICEF save the children and all of these one of the best jobs and then the last one last corporate job was in the football association Uh, okay I was the chief of operations of the league and then I quit everything just to focus on my entrepreneurship. And my first um, experience in entrepreneurship was literally when I graduated. So in parallel to my typical jobs that we all usually go through, or or what our families want us to do usually, in parallel, I had my first business, which was football fields for rent for people who want to play football with their friends. It's called the Hedaf. And then I quit all, after 12 years, I quit the corporate to do that full time. And once I did that full time, I realized, okay, I, ha- I have a bug for starting things. So I started Buchash Brothers, which is a digital growth agency, started a fashion brand, started a hair salon, now a small F&B thing that we're launching this month, any, and maybe talks. And, uh, and I think I need to go to your hair salon, Mala. You have beard to. beard is a bit uh, too intense. Come. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Best. So, so it's not too late to start something new, right? Lanam people usually get stuck in kind of this cookie cutter, um, you know way of life and they try not to escape they try not sorry to go in any different direction because they they feel like it's too late there's no need for me to to learn a new skill but you know, after 12 years you decided to do something totally different and you succeeded the thing is mine how sad is it that we box ourselves it's really sad to tell a doctor it's safe yeah. to tell a doctor you're not you're not supposed to play the violin you're a doctor why not both Why doesn't he do it semi-professionally or as a hobby? Why do we always want people to be boxed in one dimension when human beings are what? Three, four, five, seven D. We are the enemies of ourselves. Our upbringing is the enemy of ourselves. And then we think 
No, I'm a doctor. Why am I uh, why am I enjoying comics or drawing comics? Why not? We, if you just change the word why to why not in your life, literally just add that word to everything. You will change your life. Why not? And I had that, I keep repeating this story, but I think it's relevant. I remember I was, I was remember sitting in our old uh, Bukhash brother's office and I was, uh, you know, on my chair, just, you know, sitting back. And then one of the employees comes in and she goes, somebody told me that Anas is doing well with Bukhash brothers. Why does he want to open a hair salon? Can I swear, by the way, or I can't swear? You can do okay. whatever the fuck you want, man. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll tell you literally what I said. So I'm sitting there, relaxed, like, gee, Zen mood. And she goes... He, this guy said, you know, you're doing great in your digital agency. Why do you, are you open, uh, opening a hair salon? So I looked at her, I'm like, why the fuck not? Exactly. That's it. That was my answer. It stopped there. And I'm like, listen, this is life. You try. If it doesn't work, you're like, I tried. But I, I sit down on my sofa and criticize every other person who's trying. No, I'm not going to. At I least f- they're trying. I feel like with Mushtam al Arab in our Arab society, it's usually frowned upon when you kind of diverge from the usual... Uh, trajectory and if you fail they take it the very wrong way as if it's as if your entire life is going to be branded as a failure but i feel it's it's the most important teacher it's the most effective thing and for me when they say like hey there's a knight in shining armor coming to save you or whatever and i don't like the knight in shining armor not that he's going to save me but the real hero is someone whose armor is tested and tried and knows exactly what to do and more importantly what not to do so and more come in by the ham I believe in the kind of the law of cancellation. So if people really don't know what to do, they try everything. And by cancellation, okay, I did this, I didn't like it, I did that, I didn't Absolutely. like it. And then they kind of narrow it down. I think what you just said is so important to know what you don't like, eh? not what only like. People are like, I don't know what I like, what I'm passionate about. It's more important to not, to know, to know what you're not passionate about or what you don't like. You're like, جربت. Okay, now I know, out. And that's what I did with my corporate job. Every two and a half years, I had this weird circle or cycle. Every two and a half years, I'm like, "Mm, I did my best, don't like it, move. Two and a half years, three years, don't like it, move. It would never pass three years. But I would know deep down, I'm at peace that Anas, I really tried. I gave it a good shot, I did well, but I'm not enjoying this. This is not making me happy. And uh, Nido, who's my best friend, we were just talking that his father is in town from Boston. And his father is very classical, very old school, like many of our fathers. And he was saying, I had this dinner with my father and we had this conversation about this other offer that I got, very safe offer, good money, stable job. And he was saying, you know, Nido, why don't you take this job? And Nido was like, Baba, you know, I haven't asked you for money for what, 15 years, 19 years. I'm independent and I'm doing well, etc. So it's this a clash of what our old school classic mentality is. Get a corporate job, nine to five, be safe, get your insurance. But because that's how our parents are brought up, that's all they know. So when you go and come and say, I want to be an artist, he'll tell you, what do you mean? What, what does that even mean? Yeah. Can you actually make money? Be a lawyer. I want to be a wrestler. <laughs> Does that even make money? Yeah. They, it's a different language. But I think, forget all of what I just said. I think if parents just start to ask their kids, what makes you happy? Mm. That's it. Do, if you really love your child, let's say your child is now 24, you know, freshly graduated. Ask him, Habibi, are you happy in this job that I'm pushing you to do it? Are you happy? Do, that's, if, that's, if your love for your child is true love, it's not about them having a healthy bank account only. شل فايدة عند مليون مكتب تعيس. صح. شل فايدة أنت تحب تحب ولدك تحب تحبين بنتك. Where's the priority? I yeah. want them to be happy. I think for them the priority. Sorry. Hey, I think the priority for for them is just security, right? Which I understand. Yeah, you understand. But like you said, it's not everything. There needs to be something more. Like like you said, if what what in my experience and my father pushed me to do a specific thing i did economics although i hate economics um they're much smarter people than me in economics and uh, i can attest for that but he wanted to give me kind of a safety net for me bad in to be able to explore whatever you know field i want to do so i think it comes from a good place but how it's translated and how they box you is usually misinterpreted and the child feels like they're trapped mm. you know? i don't know if you um uh agree with me but corona 
change a lot of things because people uh, were forced to stop their jobs. A lot of people got uh, fired and uh, corona and the lockdown forced uh, a lot of people i know from myself to uh, reinvent reinvent we say it in english mm-hmm. reinvent themselves so if you were in a corporate job and you see now that you cannot do it anymore like in uh, uh, everything uh, related to event there's not there's not so many events right now so you have to do something else and maybe at this point you can do something you like. Mm. And I think that it's the good, uh, the, come on, the, the good uh, facet. We, yeah, it's the good thing from, uh, that we can learn from uh, all this uh, pandemic around mm. us, that you have to do something new and something else. Because mm. now yeah, a lot no of things that we, we had to stop. So you have to do something new, a job, a new job. I think two things on your point about our fathers, the degree, I'm not against degrees. I think it's an insurance policy. I like the middle ground where you say, okay, Habibi, I think you should study whatever business management, right? Because let's say it's a generic degree you can use in anything. And if you really like to be a professional horse racer, I'll give you two years after you graduate. You give it your best fucking shot. You don't do it. Go back to your business management degree. But now you see, this is a balance. And this is where your child says, I have two years, man. Two years, it's not a joke. And I think that's a healthy dynamic. And to answer you, uh, I think you're right. And I think a lot of people don't have the courage to leave a miserable job or a miserable relationship. They need a little push. So some of them, by being fired, they became creative. Or they're like, thank God, new chapter. Hmm? I would have never done this move, but Uh now... This forced me to, or they fired me. But you know what? Let me think what I can do. And and we had time to learn a new language, to to uh, to learn a lot of things. People read books. Uh, people uh, started to cook, mm. and they discovered themselves uh, in another uh, another perspective. And this is good, yeah. I think. And that's why I hate it when people say, "Let's cancel 2020. Let's move forward to 2021." Lahi. I think 2020 made you who you are, or at least made you discover who you are because you were under very strict circumstances that kind of made you have to face not only yourself, but with the people around you. You suddenly start asking a question, the person I'm living with, do I really want to spend the rest of my life with them? Or am I really that close to my kids? Or is there is there a difference? Is, it just, is our relationship just as soon as they come in uh, from school, I ask them how they are, we have dinner together, and that's it. Suddenly you're with them 24 7 and you're with yourself so a lot of people had to reevaluate that hmm. you know and what do you think about canceling 2020 no way no way i i was asked uh, the last uh, chapter we posted on ab talks for 2020 was a chapter where we allowed the audience to uh, give us questions because everybody wants to, me to sit on the other side so i did it with my brothers so i hmm. got Mu'ad Harat, and we got over 2000 questions and one of the questions that was selected, I never knew the questions till the to the recording on purpose. So one of the questions was, would you ever, what would you choose to heal in your brother's experiences? And some of my brothers went through really bad uh, periods. And I answered, I don't think I would want to, because I'm afraid if I heal some of their experiences, if I can undo it, it wouldn't make him the brother I have now. You mean? No regrets. God knows, you don't know. So. Uh, did I enjoy seeing them in pain and being helped? No, of course not. But Corona, there's so much. If you just sit down, all of us, we just list down things we learned and appreciated. You want to erase all of that? No, let's not be silly, any. No, it's. I think it's escapist, man. And we have to really, ch- not. You know, I don't know if church is the right word, but just understand that this is a moment in our past, and it made us who we are, and we have to capitalize on it. Because I don't think we're going to have something similar. I hope not. <laughs> you know, with with all the cures that are happening, and I just I, I got vaccinated with the Chinese. Uh, Welcome to vaccine. the club. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel like a superhero. No, I'm kidding. No side effects so far. There was maybe a bit of fatigue, but hopefully this is a thing of the past. And if it's going to be unique, let's just make the most out of it. You know? That's the thing. Yeah, and he, there's so many catastrophes. Uh, a lot of innocent people died, whether from the bombing, whether it's from uh, 
cancer, whether it's from Corona. Yani, there's so many things that could have been avoided or done correctly. We can sit here and just really um, look back and it will make us depressed and, and we wouldn't know how to deal with it. And you have to uh, learn and move. You cannot get stuck because you're not going to benefit the next generation or your current generation. You have to learn and move, unfortunately. And I, we wish we could undo so many things. I wish. But you have to say it is what it is, sadly. And how can I do better now? How can I benefit people? How can I be a better human? I mean, it sounds cheesy, but no, you know, it's, it's the truth, man. Did you have any like resolutions for 2021? I don't like resolutions. Me neither. I think it's bullshit. <laughs> yeah, I like directions. Okay. You tell me I have a direction. Yeah, I, need, uh, I posted yesterday on Instagram. I woke up and I'm like, let me ask uh, Instagram. Uh, let's not talk about resolutions. Give me a theme for your year. Is it the year of maybe self-educating? It's the year of uh, trying new hobbies, whatever. Give me a theme. Don't tell me I have seven things to do because things change. I mean, look at Corona, slap the whole world. Everybody had plans for 2020. It was such a sexy number. Yani, so so. Um, you have to be flexible and malleable like water. You have to move and f- with what's happening in the world, but maybe you have a direction. Well, it's the year of making my life stable. I want to invest better, whatever. So I like that. And I, I like a direction. I think also being without a direction is dangerous. A human being sometimes needs it. It's like working with employees and giving them a target. Or you tell them, no, inshallah, you just do your best and we'll see how we end the year. No, you need to give them a target sometimes, something to go to. You know? so. This is what we're doing in Lebanon right now. Because if we go and wait for things to get better, it's going to be horrible for us, you know, the situation in Lebanon right now. So we put uh, and people that are activists and want to change. Advocates for change. Yeah. Advocates for change, people that just want to so change. So we decided to wait for the next election hmm. in May 2022. And after that, we'll decide. We want to stay, we want to leave, what we're going to do. And... Um, you feel better when you put a deadline to yourself. Mm-hmm. Right now in Lebanon, the situation is so catastrophic that we don't know what we're going to do. We don't know next month if we're going to survive. We don't know if next month uh, how how much is going to be the lira. You know, we have the, the collapse of our currency. Mm-hmm. So in one year, we, we saw so many... Uh, bad things happening in 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 uh, in lebanon uh, before the blast and a kid after the blast so we cannot decide anymore we don't have this this uh, this power to make plans more than an, in another country so. you can make plan here in dubai hmm. we can't we a lot of uh, a lot of students they cannot go abroad uh, anymore to study they cannot uh, we cannot leave the country we are a little bit kind of hijacked by uh, by the sultan so come in by a terrorist organization that is closing and is not only holding the lebanese hostage but because you know they just come out and they start wagging their finger across all of the other countries the neighboring countries whether they wage war in them or they threaten them the doors this is the elephant in the room yani but lebanini hala so Lebanese can't travel anymore, whether it's to the GCC or whatever, because of this terrorist organization that is posing a threat mm. to every single one. And the the image of the Lebanese is, is, is being tarnished to the ground. And I completely understand why right now everyone is apprehensive in whether or not they're going to take Lebanese because there's a, there's a fucking high risk. You know, you never know what's going to happen. They cannot come to Dubai anymore. Yeah. For now. Mm-hmm. Inshallah. For now, for now, they cannot come uh, to Dubai. And you know, there are so many Lebanese here. And uh, there's 150,000 Lebanese. And my family uh, has been in uh, Dubai for like what 20 years. And I grew up, I had my childhood here, and it was an amazing experience. And and it's 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 been such an, a home for us, Lebanese. And so I want to ask you a question. I think 
Dubai right now is going through so many changes. And I, whenever I used to go for summer vacation in Lebanon, I used to come back to Dubai, a new city would open up. Mm. You know, it would always like expand like crazy. And, and it goes to show how Dubai is just constantly moving, constantly evolving. But I wanted to ask you, Inta, as a Muatan, as a Emirati citizen, with all this, these new changes that are happening, whether it's a new culture that is being introduced in Dubai or whatever, what exactly is and how would you describe the Emirati culture and how would you, yeah, how would you describe the Emirati culture? Emirati culture is a, a very unique blend because we are very much also attached to our uh, fathers, like Sheikh Zayed, Allah, Arhamu, Sheikh Rashid. Uh, the mm-hmm. values that comes with that, you see a lot, and even our children know, Baba Zaid, you know, like, he's not here anymore, but people still, his legacy is here. So you see that part, and the traditional part, and the conservative part sometimes, um, and then you see all this modern buildings, and, you know, the multicultural, and the Louvre, and the Burj Khalifa, and, you know, I think it's a it's very unique. It's it's just the whole thing is extremely unique, and I, I honestly feel very blessed uh, to be in a country where it's so multicultural. My kid goes to a school with so many different nationalities, and they're still getting along. You know, it's quite cool. My my businesses have what eighteen nationalities, sixteen, fourteen, twelve, and they're all working. There's harmony. There's safety. It's it's crazy. Like where do you see that in the world? I've traveled a lot. So, I've traveled a lot. Japan. Uh, America, I've been still not as multi multinational as here. Still, no. it's a beautiful melting pot. It's crazy. Mm. So I like this. For example, some some people will tell me, "Anas, you're too westernized," and some people, and I'm like, "No, I'm not," because I do like some things in the West world, and I like something in the Middle East. Yani, for example, when I was in the States, the guys would reach uh, or girls would reach 18 years old out of the house. They, if they're lucky, they see their parents twice a year. There is not that huge family bond. This is something I'm very stuck to in the Arabic culture. Okay. Family is like everything: brothers, mother, father. It's we see each other what two, three times a week. We talk. We, and it's beautiful to have that backbone. And then I see other friends who are living in other countries. They don't have that backbone, and you need it. Whether you are fifty or twenty-five, you need to your family to feel secure. And you, you notice some of. When you talk to your friends, if they have uh, father issues or mother issues, there's something eating at them. They're like, no, I don't care if I don't talk to my father. No, you do. It's a sad situation that you're not talking. You know, he's going to die in the next 20 years. Are you okay with, you know, missing? And then, and just like the AB talks, I sit down with these uh, people that are not young. Your father had a beautiful story about his father. Uh, His Excellency, Rahi Khalfan, great story with his father. And he said, Till today, when I walk to the masjid every day, I imagine my father's walking next to me because that's what I did for years with him. You know I me. Mean? And these are not 25 or 35. These are all older men who still have this huge bond with their family or they feel their presence still. So we come back to the point, do I feel too westernized? No, I think I'm a blend. I'm a global citizen, but I'll take what's good and beautiful in my culture and uh, I'll take what I learn also abroad and mix it all together and hopefully it makes me a decent person. Yeah, man, I think it's it's very simple. It's very important to kind of cherry pick exactly what works with you and what doesn't work with you. And that does, doesn't make you, I don't know, like some people go at length as, as saying they're a traitor to their culture or they're not Emirati enough or they're not Lebanese enough. But the, the point is, if you're exposed to two different cultures, you bring the best of both and you introduce this new culture in your home country because you feel it's for the benefit of others. We talked about it with Chloe Qatar. We were wondering what is the Lebanese identity because a lot of Lebanese go west, like you said, and the other, the other part goes uh, east and are more uh, oriented. And, uh, and a lot of Lebanese people think that we're not, uh, we're not the same. يعني هذا لبناني ما بيشبهني أنا مني مثله هو منه مثلي and uh, and she had the beautiful answer there is no Lebanese identity it's multiple identities mm. and uh, it looks like uh, what you said just uh, I'll ask you before. a question because I remember I remember uh, putting this also on social media because it made me curious I remember 
somebody commented me leaving from Friday prayer in my jeans and t-shirt. And they said, why don't you wear the, the kendora, the traditional garment to the masjid? And I'm like, I didn't know there was an official uniform to be Muslim. So then it made me think, and I'm like, and somebody said, you should stick to your traditions. So I'm like, okay, what is the timeline of a tradition? So if I ask you, you tell me, well, the Lebanese people like to dress this way or sing this way or speak this way. If I rewind before 100 years, was it the same? So, no. So does that make you, you just lost your tradition. So what, what is the timeline of a tradition? If I go 100 years ago uh, in the desert, the Bedouins had long hair, extremely long hair. And they had the kihl in their eyes. That's masculinity back then. It's fine. Today, if you do that, they'll say, ah, feminine. So what is traditional now? You can't define tradition. You have to be just true and decent and good and you don't harm people. Uh, he wants to wear a Pink Floyd t-shirt. He wants to have a tattoo. Is he a good human? <laughs> is he adding value? We need to stop caring about this petty shit. Wallah, mm, labas bracelet. Right. Wallah, wa who cares, man? It's his body. Is he, he doing do good? Is he taking care of orphans? Is he educating people? Is he good to his neighbor? Is he good with animals? Is he a good representation of a Lebanese man? Are you a good representation of a Lebanese woman? Bas, yes or no? It, don't go right and left. Yes or no? Yes. If they say yes, I can hamas. say yes. <laughs> no, <laughs> this person who's criticizing you, you tell him. A lot. Am I doing more good or bad? And if he says more good, halas, we're done. Then why are we talking? You know, I'm often uh, criticized because uh, I used to live in France and I don't uh, speak Arabic so well. Yeah. So a lot of time when we do sad day, I put a French sentence or French words, or even I, I, I jump to English. And because I don't know how to write and read, I'm learning uh, right now, so, but it uh, doesn't make me less Lebanese than another one. Because oh. the first, I'm Lebanese. Second, there are a lot of Lebanese like me, because you know that there is more Lebanese abroad than in Lebanon. So a lot of people are like us, uh, and we received a lot of critics about how we uh, mixed the language. Okay, we speak, you just did it. You, you talked in English and after that you speak in Arabic and we do it also. And, uh, and it's us. It is, uh, it is Lebanese people. Who am I to judge how Lebanese and how proud you are to be Lebanese? How do I know what's in your heart? So, oh. yeah, so if somebody right. comes and says, افتخر انك عربي, be proud you're Arabic. Well, how do you know if I'm not... How do you know how Emirati or how Arab or how Muslim or how anything or how do you know who gives you the right to judge my level of uh, dedication and loyalty? So uh, this, uh, this language thing is beyond me. <laughs> so I get it all the time, <laughs> all the time. So my personal value is I try not to mix. This is my personal value. If I speak Arabic with my kids or with anybody, even in an interview, 99% I speak only that language. I, I push myself to learn how to say in Arabic, uh, even saying already, we say it in Arabic, already in Arabic. And then I ask, I'm like, how do I say already in Arabic? Galu aslan. Ah, okay. Aslan in Arabic supermarket. But it's me, my own homework to myself is how can I respect each language on its own? Now, some people mix. Who am yani, Is the language more important or the content? The content, maybe me. Yeah, maybe me. But something I realized, which I found, it, Look, human beings, all of us are extremely selfish. Some way, way more. It's all about them. One of the best comments, and this has like classic, I won't forget. So I, when I posted this last AB Talks with my brothers, one of the comments was, in, in a nutshell, not literally, uh, please make the subtitles, subtitles much bigger because I still didn't have a chance to go and buy my new eyeglasses. Wallah <laughs> al And I'm like, are you like, I'm thinking, are you serious? Like, this is how you're thinking. I should change the whole format and talk to my translator and pay more money and make the font much bigger so it kills half of the screen till you go and buy an eyeglass. And then I thought about the language thing. Do you know why people criticize you mostly? Because they don't understand the other language. Exactly. It's not about, do you have pride? It's about, I don't get your fucking English. My English is poor. Speak in Arabic so I can understand you. 
it's extremely self-centered approach. It has nothing to do with culture. If you really wiggle down to the real reason why people criticize you, and sometimes they're like, يعني نحن ممكن نعرف إنجليزي لا نتكلم إنجليزي. إنزين السؤال بالإنجليزي الضيف إنجليزي شو أسوي أجبره؟ فيعني أتذكر آسيا آسيا is a Kuwaiti influence one of the first ones and Asia is half American and I sat with Asia before then too I'm like which language do you think in? She's like English. Which language do you best express yourself in? And it's English. Done. That's what I want in the interview. لا غصبا عنك تتكلمين عربي زين ما تبغى ما تعرف تعبر بالعربي يمكن تعرف بس يمكن مع دايت دايت ما ما في مو 100% ليش انتوا هالقد زعلانين وانا حاط السبتايتل يعني احنا بس بس السبتايتل از ويل بيكوز وي ريلايز از ويل ذات ذير از ا لوت اوف لابنيز اكسبيرتس ذات هاف ا بيت اوف ديفيكولتي ان اربيك ذات ريلي ابريشيت ات وين يو بوت انجلش سبتايتلز ان وين وي سبيك ان انجلش وي بوت اولسو اربيك سبتايتلز وقت مع ميا خليفه ان اتس كونت تو بي كومينج ذس تايم ويز يو قول لي انت معين هاو ديفيكولت ات از To actually do subtitles and put them in the video, it's it's a headache. It's, it's but a we're doing it because we care. Yeah. Yes. But with some people, it's not good enough. Nothing will ever be good enough. But uh, you need to maximize benefit. So, so some people like شمعنا يعني تكتب بالإنجليزي يعني ولا تتكلم بالإنجليزي. On my live yesterday, I was on Insta Live and somebody said that. Like. يعني why did you start your videos in English? Why not Arabic? يعني why the so Arabic after the English? Yeah, so for people that don't know you, when you do your videos, you give first, uh, you know, English language, and then you speak in Arabic, and you tell people what is the time code so Correct. that they can access it. Which Still is, not good enough. Yeah, but like, but what I'm trying to say is somebody wrote that. إشمعنى يعني تفضل الإنجليزي على العربي واحد عشان اللغة الإنجليزية اليوم اليوم في هالزمن أقوى. أكيد. It's much more universal. So I want my content to be as universal. Man, half of the Arabs speak more English than Arabic. Uh, if I watch a movie, I don't read the Arabic subtitle. I go to the listen to the English. You tell me read a book. Personally, I would read English before Arabic. So let's talk about facts, not emotional allegiances. Which language is more universal? English. And I told them, I said, I'm like, Ya Habaibi, instead of always importing knowledge and importing books, an importing i don't know even this show why aren't we exporting now you're exporting two lebanese people sitting down talking about conversations that nobody's talking about being bold opening a, a can of worms addressing elephants in the room fucking zoo good ليش نفكر ايش معنى يعني مو عين يتكلم انجليزي شو يعني عند جمهور انجليزي بالعكس انت قول قول الحمد لله في واحد من الموضوع. دمي في واحد من بلادي في واحد من مدينتي يسمعون للجانب هذا شرف لنا كلنا صح وي هاف تو سويتش وي هاف تو سي اند وي ذس از ذس ذا لوكال مينتاليتي وير وي ثينك اند اي توك تو ا لوت اوف بيبل هو هاف جود بوتنشال بزنسز اند ذير لايك يا ان شاء الله ويل اوبن انذر برانش يو نو ان جيميرا تو اند ذن ميبي ان ديرا ام لايك واي نوت اوت سايد اف يو ثينك يو ار اونلي لوكال يو اولويز ريمين لوكال صح واي نوت ثينك ام غانا فرانشايز ام غانا اوبن ان سنغافوره ان طوكيو اند لندن Why not? Why do we have? Why do we box ourselves and limit ourselves? So if you're going to think all of our influencers and all of our bloggers are just good enough in region and only good in Arabic, guess what? Then we're yes, limiting. Yeah. that's where we will be always. We have to think how can Arabs show that they're educated or have an open mind and look what happened with Emirates. Culture and beautiful look, values. Emirates, what, Emirates Airline, yani, Emirates Airline is, I think, the most important export in the world. Arabic, yani. hmm? and look, look where it went because you had the vision because. You know, there we were. We. Um, it is a we. It is a it we. It represents all of us. Exactly, it represents yeah. all of us on football teams and what have you. That right now we are providing a service that is recognized on a global level. So why the hell do we have to stop? I think one of the nicest mm-hmm. Lebanese exports is Zat <laughs> Rouzet. <laughs> Whatever it is. I'm I'm so happy when I see all these uh, uh, shops, restaurant, uh, Lebanese restaurant here. Mm. I'm so happy to see them. Oh God, it's Abdul Wahab, Zat Rouzet, Karibou Cafe. So you know, it's. Uh, And something it's, it's yeah. nice something man yes and yeah. it's so cool. we have to be happy for each other this is the thing we can't keep attacking if we keep attacking each other of course we're not gonna go anywhere i feel in the air world it's it's kind of like a thing to directly attack people or directly attack anyone that slips or fucks up it's like they 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 relish in it there know? is joy in it for sure yeah. if you wanted to be a footballer and then the other guy failed you're like i eh, see he's not even good Yeah, it makes you feel of, better that you didn't make it. 
Exactly. It's, you know? it's, a, it's, an, it's a German word, it's called schadenfreude. It's, it means the pleasure that you get from seeing someone else fail. That's why when you have celebrity tabloids and someone, I don't know, just went to rehab because they fucked up or they OD'd or whatever, you get a bit of pleasure in knowing that this icon that was so successful fucked up. Instead, you have to say, oh shit, they're human just like you and me. They have their own insecurities. <laughs> and that's the AB Talks show. Exactly. It's the human behind the title. You tell me what's the show about? It's about the human. I'm not going to talk about your father's uh, dynasty and his legacy and all of that. He's not, no, it's okay. We all know that. Body. How is his relationship with his parents? How was his childhood? Yeah. What's tough for him? You humanize people, man. And I don't know. Look, in the end, uh, I just want all of us to ha- switch our mentality. And a bit, I'm not expecting everybody to jump on board and support and clap. No, it's fine. But don't um, be unfair. Don't be unfair to a Mu'in, don't be unfair to Anas, don't be unfair to anybody. You know, if you think they're doing more good than bad, support. If you don't like it, it's okay. Don't follow, don't promote, don't share. It's okay. You have every right. But it doesn't give you the right to go and criticize and change their words or or do any of that. Talking talking about the human aspect of of celebrities, you, you kind of humanize yourself to a certain extent where you brought your mom to sit down with you, right? Mm. And you guys had a talk together. And I think it's it's a very unique and important kind of piece of content. I'm not gonna call it content. More importantly, it's a conversation between a son and uh, his mom. And to, so if you can explain to people what your mom does exactly and why you brought her on the show and how was it? My mom doesn't like the word life coach, so I'm not gonna use it. She's more a well-being uh, mentor or I don't know what title is. It's a kind of an entrepreneur, like a social entrepreneur. And she works a lot with Arab women, especially on well being. So she takes them on hiking trips, on trekking trips, on well being. With Arab courses, women in particular. Especially. And it's only women. Uh, because she really believes, you know, if the woman is uh, refreshed or in a good state of mind, the whole household changes, the whole company 100%. changes. I agree. And she's done a lot for women. Uh, so that's what she does. And I learned a lot, like when somebody asked in the interview, your mother in one word, and I said school. She's my my first school, my education, my life. Ex- my mother never finished college, but if you tell me about how, how do I speak like this, so much of the credit goes to her. I mean, next time we do a barbecue, you sit with her, you'll understand what I'm trying to say. Um, I wanted to get her because uh, we have such a close relationship. Me and my mother have this unique relationship of mother, sister, friend. We have only 18 years between us. So it's kind of confusing sometimes how to deal with her, you know, but it's unique, it's special. And I know how bold and how uh, brave she is. And I know she has a a story and a story that a lot of women especially would connect to. And uh, I wanted to bring her and I told her, listen, and I started the interview by saying, mom, you're not my mother for the next hour and I'm not your son. I'm going to conduct it like a professional interviewer. And she broke down three times in the interview and I'm still, and people are like, oh, you're so cold hearted. <laughs> and you make her cry and you don't even give her a tissue. Da, 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 da. <laughs> but, and some people were like, it was so professional that you didn't just, you know, get emotional and just drowned in the whole thing with her. And the idea was, I knew, and I'd love to know your thoughts when you watch it. I knew that every woman that would see this would see herself in something. Hello, we'll link it to the description. Can Something. They would see, and that, you just read the comments. I saw myself and your mother when she went through this. I saw, and my mother talked about divorcing my father. She talked about depression. She talked about being broke. She talked about so many things. And uh, it's just a unique setup of, you know, mother and son to be so open in the Arab world and talk about, I left your father and I was depressed and I didn't have money when I was calling you and, 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 and. You know, and her mother going through cancer. And it was hard, it was tough because I have to be composed. And it's my mother. Come on. A bit tricky. More tricky than usual, let's say. Because, come in, um, women in uh, the Arab world, and we know this uh, from Lebanon also, they don't have a voice. They cannot, Allah, maybe more today, but they don't speak, they don't say. Uh, I know, I know because of myself, I divorced also and I talk about it and I received a lot of message uh, saying, oh, I went 
through this also and now I recognize myself in you mm. and I'm so happy when I receive this kind of comments uh, because the the situation of women in the Arab world is is tough and even if there is a kind of emancipation and uh, we are changing things it's it's still very slow for us. And uh, even if uh, Lebanon is uh, considered, we say considered in English, mm. oh, yeah. mm. um, good tonight, uh, as an uh, open country, very open uh, mind country, it's not true. On the, on the ground, you, you don't see women talk about things and uh, about their struggles and everything. So I understand and I'm looking forward to watch this episode because uh, I think that uh, it's very important to uh, to make people to make women talk absolutely I think um, it's a men and women problem in the Arab world we are not taught. talking we are, men uh, have the suicide rights rates way more than uh, women and because the rates are more violent men, I mean the, the suicides are more violent usually yeah and men uh, I have a friend who committed suicide last year uh, Italian guy. I don't want to say, of course, the name, but um, he say he uh, said why. Um, Before he wrote letters. Uh, family guy, over fifty, beautiful human being. We would have never known. Left a mother, uh, wife, uh, three boys. It was very sad to be at the funeral. But do I know how he felt? No, nobody knew. And uh, coming back to your point, I think women for sure. Uh, need to be uh, more vocal and I think they are now with social media change yes. a lot of things you minus 50 years ago oof, big difference when my mother got divorced it was a disaster disaster her family wouldn't talk to her, her own family so imagine you divorce somebody so that family obviously automatically from that day you're out but then you don't have anywhere to go because your own family doesn't want you now so why the hell would why wouldn't they want to bring you in or at least it's shameful Back then, yeah. shoo, shoo, talag. you're joking? What an embarrassment you are. Exactly. That's the word, embarrassment, because yeah. they take it upon shaming. themselves as a failure and they shaming. shame. Shame is a huge issue. Man, we live with shame in the Arab world. Yes. From the moment you're exactly. born, aib, 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 aib. Hatta aib is more than haram. <laughs> yani whether you're Christian or Muslim, there are things that are haram. Aib is way bigger, way bigger. Aib, what will they say? Aib, what will they think? What is this aib? Why are we always, who, who gives a shit about all of these people? Are they paying your bills? No. Are they building your house? No. Who are they? Who are these? Let's sit down. Who are those people that were aib from? Oh, aib, aib, aib. Who? Who? Please bring them to my table now. The people in the comments. <laughs> the so society and that's what they talk about with. norms. And there is no norms. We are and so norm. afraid of mean. And what if people will say something? Yalla, hmm. talk. What? It will change your life, it will make you sleep better. They clap for you, oh, thank God, okay, clap, it's nice, and then what? So this Aib mentality is is very dangerous and it, it inhibits man. people, it inhibits a child. Habibi Aib, Habibi Aib, let's say we, Aib, Aib, you just screwed that kid's personality. He doesn't know how to be, you know, himself. He can't. So uh, coming to your point, men and women both, they really need to be vocal and, and me and you, what we're doing, we need uh, another 20 programs like ours. Absolutely. For these things exactly. to change, you know? I think one podcast at a time, one show at a time. And uh, like you like you were saying, like what your mother is doing, and I think like what we're doing is just we're normalizing these conversations that are usually held behind closed doors because there's a need to talk about what makes us human. I mean, what you see on traditional TV right now is not at all what is happening on the ground and it's not at all representative of reality. And that's why people disconnect. That's why people feel themselves feel like they're isolated. Mm. And suddenly, when you talk about this this problem, you feel like you're not alone, and you get encouraged to talk about them with your friends. And that's what's even more important is the friendship circle that you have. Why the hell would you want to be surrounded by people that are just so full of shit that make you miserable that you can't even talk? You know, sometimes. You, you feel boxed and you're like, I'm not going to talk th about this to my friend because he's going to think I'm a pussy or he's going to think that, I don't know, uh, I'm not I'm not man enough or I'm I'm a bad person. If that person is really your friend, they're going to want to listen to you or else they're not your friend. 
There's a good filter. Should... Absolutely. Good filter to know whether he should be your friend or not. Both of you said something really interesting and very important. You said when you talked about your divorce, how uh, women would reach out to you because then suddenly they know that they can relate to you. And you said something just now that um, to know that you're not alone. And I think that's one of the most powerful things. Uh, and the point of one of the main pillars of why I do the AB talks is when you look at it and watch and you're like, okay, somebody else is also going through what I'm going through. That is so powerful not to feel alone. The moment, I'll give you an example. Think of a bad experience in your life where you were alone versus you were with one of your friends who experienced the same shit. Way nicer, way more comfortable that somebody Thank shared you. the burden. You feel like... And then you'll talk, you remember what happened when it's much nicer. Exactly. You share the and trauma. And we need to feel that. We yeah, need it's to much know easier. that we're not alone. And you can, you can live better. You can be more hopeful that you have hope. And my mother is an example of that. You're an example of that. A beautiful woman talking, brave. It's beautiful. And for a woman who's maybe fragile now, who was maybe in your shoes 10 years ago, or my mother's shoes 20 years ago, who was thinking, will I even ever get out of this? hole it's a hole it's a dark hole how will i ever get out no way i have no hope nobody will support me where will i get money how can i ever be happy again and when you're in that dark room in your head you don't think there's an exit but then you listen and i have so many messages i've captured them that after i watched some i'm like okay there is hope for me if this guy who had it worse or this woman who had it worse could do it well maybe i have a chance so mess enough you're good there. This is what I think happened to us during the August 4th blast, Mike. Yeah. Like, we would sleep at what? Like, 3 o'clock in the morning after the blast. 5, 5. 5 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> the day of. And when we went down, you know, on the ground, we, the only thing that allowed us to stand up on our two uh, feet was the people that were around us that shared the trauma, that were trying to do something good. And just, it goes back to what you say, just surround yourself by the right people by the right environment and you'll see how you can flourish and until were you ever in a dark place before and you felt trapped or something i was never depressed and i'm i'm lucky uh, whether it's my brain chemicals or my situational experience never really reached depression thankfully and i hope i don't but i've i've met and listened to many people who, who've been through depression doesn't mean i know how they feel uh, but I can try to understand, and I, I think I do, uh, and try to sympathize maybe more than empathize because I literally can't really put myself in their shoes. But it takes a toll on you. It does, yeah. I remember the worst emotion I've ever felt was being helpless, and at least two times in my life where I couldn't do something for somebody I love and I'm used to being able to. But in those situations, I can't and I just have to wait. And it's a shitty feeling, especially if you're the one who usually fixes things. So that was a very bad emotion. And I remember after the surgery on my knee, and I was much younger, this is 2003. Um, I remember everybody's like, oh, it's okay, it's okay. And I was in so much pain because I didn't know how to take the painkillers. So I was feeling the pain all the time. And the thing that made me feel better, is it pisses you off. Like, I, I don't know if this pisses you off, but if somebody comes and says, yeah, I'm sure it's real. And they're like, let's say in Norway. And they're like, I'm sure it was really tough in Lebanon. And you're like, mm, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about, but thanks. You know, it's like nice of you, but you know, deep down, you don't get it. It's okay. I appreciate your message, but you don't get it. But when somebody from your neighborhood comes and says, shit, that was tough. And this is what happened to my mother. And you're like, okay, this person understands, understands. So for me, all of my friends or tried to sympathize with me. I wouldn't say it pissed me off, but I knew it didn't relieve my pain, mentally especially. So I went to a forum online with all these ACL reconstruction surgery people. And we were all talking, oh, you can't even sleep. I couldn't sleep for the last three days. What? And suddenly you don't feel alone and they get it. So even if it's through a screen, more and important than your friends. That's why this is important. No. Because somebody can be listening. We, you can't imagine. You, I'm sure you get some messages. God knows what are the messages you don't get, or somebody never sends you. That somebody is sitting down there and listening, and yeah. feeling. You know what? I'm not alone. Yeah. Somebody gets me. Do you want to tell the Mia Khalifa story about the girl? About the girl. Yeah, it's. Uh, it's. I think that it's one of the most beautiful message we received. 
So we had uh, Mia Khalifa as a guest, you know her. Mm. And uh, okay, and all the scandals uh, around her. And um, she said when uh, we talked about her uh, not career, because she only did four movies in the porn industry, that um, because she had to wear the hijab and it was, uh, and she understood that it was like an insult uh, for Muslims, she. Uh, um, she apologized uh, for every girl and woman that had been uh, insulted and said, you are Mia Khalifa because it was girls, not uh, in Arab countries or in Lebanon, but abroad, because they were wearing the hijab and glasses, hmm. eyeglasses like her. And uh, we received a message from a young uh, woman saying that she's been insulted several times and yeah Mia Khalifa and Mia Khalifa and she said that she was uh, wondering who was uh, Mia Khalifa so she went on her social medias and she watched Sardi and when she watched Sardi and she realized who was Mia Khalifa what she did for Lebanon after the blast she gave uh, from her own money 100,000 uh, dollars uh, to help the Red Cross and she did a lot of awareness uh, for uh, for Lebanon and she lives in uh, LA and when she saw this she told us that she was proud to be named Mia Khalifa and it was amazing to see that how you can change the perspective of someone this this girl Akid was feeling alone and really lonely when she uh, she got all this insult and bullied by people um, and it was so nice to see that uh, her perspective changed and I hope that she changed the perspective of people that were insulting her and it's really nice message and we receive a lot of messages like this because we talked about mental health and suicide with uh, Mia, Mia Hatoui and we talked about prison with Ali Baroudi, mm. who went uh, uh, through a hard time for five years in uh, in prison, in jail in in Lebanon. We talked about sexuality with uh, Sandrine Atala that has a podcast, and uh, her podcast is uh, listened uh, not only in Lebanon, but in all the uh, Arab countries. And uh, we talked about a lot of taboos, and that's how people feel comfortable after that, because they realize that they're normal, you know, when you talk about sexuality and uh, about habits or fantasies or what people like or don't like, and you listen to this or you watch this and you realize that, ah, okay, I have the same fantasy, so <laughs> I'm normal. I'm not uh, so so weird. And it's so important for us. That's why we, we decided. And even when we were alone on the show uh, in the beginning for the fourth, uh, first uh, episodes, we talked about a lot of things women, women's uh, role in society, uh, how we struggle, uh, still struggling. And um, people, uh, I think that's why people like uh, to, to watch us. And it's, in, it's important. It's important because a lot of uh, these people like Ali Baroudi, um, it was the first time he, he talked publicly about his uh, experience wow. in prison. Hmm. And a lot of people and a lot of his friends didn't know they 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 called us after that and they said i didn't know that ali went through this and it was it was so uh, so good he felt relieved and it was like a therapy for him and for people that went through exactly the same experience and yeah it's important and so is, is there a comment that really touched you with that kind of reaffirmed what you're doing many mine uh i i screen capture them because i know i have a shitty memory mm. But many stand out, and one of the most things that I um, enjoy uh, reading is when somebody writes under the video, I used to love this person, now I love them more. And I get it all the time. Uh, that the, the guest, because you just humanize them. Even your dad. <laughs> somebody messaged me and he said, um, I've known your father for 20 years. I never knew the stories that you shared. Mm that he shared with you. And uh, I think it's kind of what you said. It's, see, I think the one of the main things you have to extract out of this uh, last uh, eight minutes or whatnot is um, if we just learn to judge less, because we all judge. We are all preconditioned. We are uh, preju preju prejudiced. 
Uh, but the more aware and the more educated you are about life, the more you learn and the more you experience and meet people, the more you're like, shit, why did I judge this person? Why did I think they're arrogant? Why, why, why? The more you're like, I should chill, not be emotional about my judgment. Let me take one step back. Okay, two, maybe three. Why am I jumping to a conclusion? And the more you give yourself that handbrake and you, or a reverse sometimes, you learn to leave the judgment to God you know, it's not our role. Our role is not to judge other people. How do I know what's in his heart or in your soul and in your mind and your intention? I don't know. I don't know what you've gone through. I don't know the shit that you have to deal with, whether it's a lot or nothing. I don't know anything. I don't know anything. So who, how can I judge? You'll never be fair. Never. None of us. So yeah. the moment we realize we are extremely incompetent to judge another human being, it grounds us. Who the fuck are you to judge? Maybe. You don't know. I don't know. But somebody tells you their story and then suddenly you're like, Oof, why did I judge? And you feel bad. And maybe they're bad people. It's okay. Maybe they're good people. But still not your shame. This is when you should feel ashamed. It's when it's, it's you yeah. project something that turned out to be completely false. And if you're right, let's say you're right, Moin. Still not your place. Sorry. None of us. Maybe it is a bad person. Still not our judgment. And what is bad? Yalla. Let's play the relative game, oh. subjective game. We don't know, you know, we really don't know. There's a beautiful uh, story in Islam about uh, uh, a woman who, uh, or a man, I'm not, I don't remember the exact story, but not a good person apparently, but then he was very nice to an animal, to a dog, and then that was enough to cover all of his sins. So I don't know, I'm not uh, an expert in religion, but um, the idea that Somebody can do one beautiful thing that can cover thousands of so, maybe mistakes. There are and no small how deeds. can you judge? Uh, a guy we think is a piece of shit and then he goes and uh, we realize when he dies that he opened an orphanage and he educated 50 orphans. What the fuck did I do on you compared to this guy? It's, it's very interesting what you said about the religion because uh, in, uh, in, the, in the Evangel, in the Bible, uh, the Christ, uh, when uh, when he saw Marie Madeleine, you know, and uh, she was a prostitute, and everybody was judging her, and he said, uh, "The one who didn't sin, let throw her, her uh, a stone." Hmm. And this is very interesting because everybody judges on behalf of religion, and they always has this excuse and not, you know, you know, religion says that no, it's not true. In all the religions, you have the forgiveness. And this is what I don't understand today when people uh, bring the subject of religion and say hype. Hype for who? I'm uh, haram. Eh? Yeah. And selon qui? Mm. En français. <laughs> so very interesting. I like yeah, this word. You know, when we're, as Lebanese come in, we, can, we usually judge. I and mean, let's talk about Dubai, for example. People tell me, yeah, Moin, uh, when it comes to Dubai, you know, it's a country that was founded uh, 50 years ago. I think it was 2nd of December, 1971. And yeah, you know, their culture is still blooming. You know, our culture, we, we, we have hundreds and thousands of years. I look at them like, look at the Lebanese culture and what it led to right now. And look at the Dubai culture, look at the Emirati culture and what it was able to achieve in just 50 years. Who are you to simply judge? And what is what do you want to say about Lebanon? Oh, you can ski and uh, swim on the same fucking day. Okay, so fucking what? We're in a shit show. Our the entire um, population is held hostage. Look at Dubai. Look what it's doing to its citizens. I think Dubai. I'm talking about personal experience. I'm not paid by anyone. I wish. <laughs> 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 but I think Dubai has been very unique and trying to find an opportunity in each crisis and you know, from the gulf war to the uh, gulf uh, to the war between saddam hussein and and the rest of the arab countries to right now with what's happening with corona right now we go to restaurants we enjoy uh, life in dubai and we feel safe there's a certain level of security that you don't have in lebanon lebanon people are partying left right and center and the cases of corona are exponentially increasing over there, it might have the same, you know, you might be in the same restaurant in Dubai and in Lebanon. Same level of activity, but in Dubai you feel safe and in Lebanon you feel not safe. Hmm. How come? And there's a level of leadership here 
that is just benevolent that, that provides security. You were saying, uh, Baba Zayed, our president, Halu, he calls himself Bayil Kill, the father of all. He's known as that in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> Not even for his daughters. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, yeah, yeah. What do you think is the magic formula for for Dubai and you know for the Emirates for it to have led to this success? I think we were very fortunate to have the, our leadership you know um, some countries are not so fortunate to get leaders and that they're not good for them we were simply very fortunate to have beautiful educated and people who actually care for their people you know that there is a story i was told that sheikh zaid allah used to pay families to send their kids to school not the parents pay to take their kids to school. He pays them to say, please take them to school. Because education is the most important tool. But back then they thought my child is better working, so, right? To earn money for the household. So imagine, imagine just that. I'm a leader. I'm paying people to send my people to get educated. Sheikh Rashid Allah built Port Rashid, the biggest port at the time. Who, I'm sure people were like, why do you need to open a port? But he, he built it and it became a hub, a hub for business and all of that. So when you're fortunate to have leaders that think bigger than themselves, they think for the people, your show, my show, it's bigger than us, mine. If we don't do things that are bigger than us, then we're selfish people. Then just talking. In it's the all about us then. But when you're a human being who thinks it's your duty to think bigger than you, that when you leave, you want people to remember you in good words like that's what you want in the end and then when you have kids or whatever you choose kids or no kids cousins you want people to remember you well it will make people who come after you this life's easier and if, if people like me more than they don't hopefully the balance is more <laughs> positive it's going to be better for my kids it's going to be so if i love my kids i need to leave them with something positive if i want to leave the earth with 0.00001 percent better Great. Did something. Great, I did something. I added value. I wasn't just a waste of oxygen. So I think coming back to your question, we are really, truly blessed with a leadership that really cares for its people. And they're hungry and they're ambitious. And in Lebanon, we cursed. Because you gave two examples, the port and the education. And right now, they destroy the port. Our leaders, they destroy the port and half of Beirut. And kids, they cannot go to school or university anymore because of the... It's too expensive. Of, yes, it's too expensive and they cannot leave the country to go and study uh, somewhere else. And you are lucky. You are really lucky. And I think there are certain things that... I, I'm not a huge fan of the word luck, but for sure there are th things that you're lucky. Your color, your height, your nationality where you're born, your parents, your leaders, these are luck. You don't, you were born and you inherit them. And we are, for sure we are. And it's, it's a blessed time for us. It's proud, I'm very proud to be in this country. I don't want to be anywhere else. Why would I want to? Yeah. And I'm sorry, I don't mean this to make you feel No, bad. luck is man, it's something to, to yeah. look up to, yeah. to be honest. I mean, we're, we are fortunate. And I think, uh, forget the borders and the lines in the end, uh, I think UAE has been a huge home for Lebanon. Agreed. A lot of Lebanese people build their businesses, their kids are here, their schools are here, their homes are here. They see it as a second home. Yes, there is the discussion that it will never be home. True, where you're born has a sentimental value. Uh, but Alhamdulillah, you've, you as Lebanese people have also added a lot of value in this country. We'd like to think and so you've, uh, you Look, in the end, the UAE, uh, and I said this, it's, it's a collective effort from the guy cleaning the streets, to the labor worker building the building, to the engineer, to the architect, to the designer, to the artist, to the musician. Without it, there's no flavor, it's vanilla. No. You want flavor, you want people, and you want experiences and people coming in from different. And I think I always say this, I think Lebanese people are one of the most educated Arabs in the world. It's such a shame. And we talked about this also in our other video about the blast. 
one of the highest potential Arabs in the world, but unfortunately, not a lot of things are going for them at the at the yeah. time. I tell you, by the way, you, you know, just for people to know, you were, I think, one of the only people that decided to reach out to the Lebanese to ask them you know, how they are. And you reached out to me, you reached out to Gino and Marianne uh, Wehbe. And it wasn't as if you did the report and you know you talked about exactly what happened. No, you reached out to the people to know exactly. And you didn't talk about politics because obviously everyone has had enough and you were just asking how and the I'm fuck not they good. were. I'm really not <laughs> interested in politics. Yeah. I know people tell you you should be, I'm not. It never did it for me. I'm not interested in politics, so I don't talk about it. I know where my limits are. It's not my thing. Okay, but man, I want, man. what I cared about that was the human. What are you guys going through? Thank let, you for let that, us know. Way. Let us let people understand a little more. Let the world know. Yeah, yeah, agreed. The Kamen, yani, your politics, thankfully, are, are boring. Yani, mafi mashakel. You know, <laughs> for us, <laughs> it's constant. It's, it's in your face. Every day. day. <laughs> it's every yeah. day. We want our politics to be boring and for us to be uninterested, but it's it's a bit difficult when our leaders are as incompetent as, as children and you know no one is no one knows what they're doing so i i hope that our politics will be as boring and i hope that we can then focus on what kind of what furthers us as human beings and how we can give back to our country you know instead of asking what this person can do for me and this is what we're trying to do we're trying. Mm, that's all, all somebody can ask you to do. Um, I think we reached the end of the podcast. Yes. Um, Anas, is there like a few things you want to uh, let us know um, what you're working on? Any future projects that people need to kind of, and final words, if you will. No, I'm not going to use this to promote anything. Uh, who, who's interested will always find it. All right. Uh, I want this to be purely about, you know, three people and just having a having good a conversation yeah. having a sad day yeah behind all of the things we do on the formal cv yeah. uh, but i enjoyed this guys like um it's always nice to sit with people with uh, rich minds yeah and who are real and raw and bold yeah. so yeah i enjoyed this i hope you did what would, yeah, what, did. What would yeah. you tell people for 2021 in just a few sentences it's tricky man after Corona, you're afraid to say anything. Yeah. I remember, I remember being on an interview 2019, and I'm like, "You're 2020." I'm like, and I look, and people send me that clip. I'm like, "Yeah, how did Sorry that turn that. out?" So I, I don't know. Um, I would say just to have a direction. It's good to have a general direction, and just work day by day. We have no guarantees, man. We can be dead tomorrow. We can be dead in a second. Uh, we have no guarantees in life, and. Uh, I don't mean, oh, live every day as it's your last day. I never really liked that uh, saying. Because I think it's just too tiring to live every day as if it's your last day. Imagine doing like 300 things at the same time. So. I just make the best of it, you know, make the best of your days, have a direction. Uh, and don't forget the important things in life. I think before Corona, all of us did. Life took us success, or money, or fame, or I think that gave us a nice slap yeah. to think about the important things. Yeah. Thanks for coming, Anas. Mm, Thank pleasure. you. Pleasure. Shukran. Thank you. <laughs>